This week, we speak with Mary Olson, Director of the Southeast Office of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NIRS. We discuss a very important and little-known fact about nuclear radiation, that it has been proven to have a greater impact on females, both adult women and young girls, than on males. It's a stunning interview with massive implications that I also address as part of today's final thought. Plus, in this show, we have the ever-popular features, Numb Nuts of the Week, Activist Shoutouts, The Daily Show, Make Me Your Nuclear Pundit, whoever you may turn out to be, and more nuclear information than is likely to show up in all of U.S. mainstream media combined on Fukushima's fourth anniversary. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 17, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. A magnitude 6.9 earthquake hit the northeast coast of Japan on Monday, February 16. Evacuations were ordered for towns closest to the coast in Iwate Prefecture after the Japan Meteorological Agency issued a tsunami warning and Japan broadcaster NHK warned residents that a one-meter-high wave was expected to hit the coast. The quake shook most of the northeast coast of Japan and was even felt in Tokyo. 430 miles away. The Japan Meteorological Agency cast the quake as an aftershock of the 9.0 Tembler that rocked Japan on March 11, 2011, and initiated the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. However, the U.S. Geological Survey did not characterize the quake as an aftershock, instead considering it a separate event. The earthquake was felt from Chiba to Hokkaido over a distance of more than 1,000 kilometers. This is the most powerful earthquake to hit Japan since a magnitude 7.1 was registered on October 25th of 2013. Interesting to note that as of recording time this evening, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has not issued any statement about the current condition at Fukushima Daiichi and what impact, if any, the quake may have had upon it. Nearly half of the entire population of Itate Village, Fukushima Prefecture, filed a petition with the Nuclear Damage Compensation Dispute Resolution Center demanding measures to restore the lives of the nuclear disaster victims. The petitioners are 2,837 villagers from 737 households, and the petition is addressed to the president and CEO of Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, Naome Hirose. The main points of the petition, which seek arbitration for an out-of-court settlement, include the petitioners calling on TEPCO to admit legal responsibility for causing serious radioactive contamination in the village and inflicting massive damage on the villagers and to sincerely apologize to the villagers for this. They have asked for TEPCO to pay 3 million yen, about $25,000, to each villager to compensate for mental anguish regarding their health and other physiological stress caused by radiation exposure that could have been prevented A third point is that they want to raise the amount of compensation for the period of evacuation from 100,000 yen per person, about $838 per month, to 350,000 yen per person, which is just a little over $3,000. There are other aspects to this as well, which have been compiled in a booklet that contains the text of the petition and part of the accompanying materials. We will have a link to this up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 191. At least 1,000 homes in Fukushima Prefecture will be demolished, even though they have gone through the failed government quote-unquote decontamination process. The so-called decontamination process is seen by many activists as a sop to the Japanese people to convince them that the living area is safe when indeed it still is not. Local officials in Fukushima Prefecture say that 
Demolishing the homes is a waste of time and money, and they call on the government to run the decontamination work more efficiently. Can't be done, guys. You cannot put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound of this magnitude. Besides the radiological problems, officials say leaking rain into the homes and animal intrusions, especially those pigs, that's literal, not metaphoric, they're wild boars, these animal intrusions are damaging the homes while residents remain evacuated. Many evacuees have given up on returning and found new homes instead. Others who lack that financial option are still stuck in limbo after almost four years. The three-ring circus of incompetence that is in daily evidence at the site of the nuclear disaster at Fukushima Daiichi continues with even more bad news leaking out. TEPCO is trying to block the flow of radioactive water from reactor buildings to the underground tunnels. Workers were supposed to remove the highly radioactive water, and after that they would have filled in the tunnels with cement. However, efforts to block the flow of water have failed. The engineers need to fill some gaps that may have been left in the area where the tunnels and reactor buildings meet. TEPCO officials met with members of the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Authority, which approved a plan to delay the project. This setback will likely affect a second project, already discredited and considered a failure, to build an ice wall around the four damaged reactor buildings. TEPCO officials will admit that they are already two weeks to a month behind schedule on that work, which many engineers and all activists are predicting will never be successfully completed and implemented. Even the International Atomic Energy Agency says that contaminated water leaking from the Fukushima nuclear plant is still, quote-unquote, a challenging issue. You think? Still, that's quite an admission from the IAEA. A Bloomberg report on the agency notes the agency's safety division garnered little respect in U.S. diplomatic cables that described the department as a marketing channel for countries seeking to sell atomic technology. The IAEA's own mission is to promote atomic power. So if the IAEA says that the situation at Fukushima is quote-unquote challenging, you better believe it's a whole lot worse than that. In fact, the IAEA issued a report today, February 17, 2015, that expressed concern about increasing amounts of radiation-contaminated water at Fukushima Daiichi and cited persistent underground water flooding in the main buildings as a major challenge still to be faced. Moving to the international report, it's been 29 years since an explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear plant in Ukraine released large doses of radiation across Europe. But the effects of that devastating event could still be affecting the continent as a result of three relatively recent forest fires in Ukraine. According to new research, these fires are causing radioactive cesium in the soil around the nuclear facility to be released into the atmosphere as smoke which then travels across Eastern Europe. Between two and eight petabecquerels of radiation can still be found in the upper levels of the soil in the exclusion zone. And to get an idea of how much that is, one petabecquerel of radiation equals a million billion becquerels. And remember, in terms of food in Japan, 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram of food is the absolute upper limit of what's allowed. Not what's safe, but what's allowed. So we're talking an incomprehensible massive amount of radiation that is still in the duff, in the forest, in the leaves, in the things that grow there, and in the animals that eat those plants. Major forest fires swept the area during 2002, 2008, and 2010. Now, scientists from the Norwegian Institute for Air Research measured radiation levels in the soil and atmosphere. They discovered that these fires caused around 0.5 
had a back rolls of radioactive cesium to be released over Eastern Europe as smoke. So that's half a million billion back rolls. Scientists warn that the situation could get worse as climate change makes these fires more common. This is excerpted from a rather long article, and we'll have a link up on the website. In Belgium, additional inspections at Electrobel's Dewel 3 and Tehenge 2 power reactors have revealed more extensive flaking within their reactor pressure vessels than previously identified. This according to the Federal Agency for Nuclear Control, the Belgian regulator. An inspection carried out by Electrobel in 2014 resulted in detection of a greater number of flaw indications than were measured in 2012 and 2013. How many? The tests revealed a stunning 13,047 cracks in Dewell 3 and 3,149 cracks in Tehenge 2. The director general of the Belgian nuclear regulator admitted this may be a global problem for the entire nuclear industry. The solution is to implement worldwide accurate inspections for all 430 nuclear power plants. That might be a really good idea because out of Australia comes a PDF booklet entitled Let the Facts Speak, an Indictment of the Nuclear Industry. It's 170 pages long, and it lists every nuclear accident we know of that has been committed. Categories include nuclear power plants and fuel fabrication plants, nuclear weapons, including weapons production plants, security threats, terrorism, smuggling, sabotage, and theft, research facilities, including research reactors and experimental reactors, waste, including spent nuclear fuel reprocessing, uranium mining, milling, conversion, and enrichment, transport, nuclear-powered or nuclear-armed vessels, and medical facilities and procedures. We'll have a link up to where you can download this amazing document on the website under this episode, number 191. Over to the United States where the Vermont Department of Health announced on Monday afternoon, February 9th, that it had found strontium-90 in groundwater monitoring wells at the now-closed Vermont Yankee nuclear reactor. The tests showed strontium-90, a known cancer-causing radioactive nuclide, in about half the levels established for safe drinking water. The test results were taken in November and double-checked at a national laboratory. In a press release, the Vermont Health Department said, These new findings of strontium-90 in groundwater monitoring wells are an important indicator of what has leaked from the structures, systems, and components at Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Station. It is likely that strontium-90 in groundwater and soils at Entergy's Vermont Yankee are the result of past leaks as well as fallout and air releases at the station during its years of operation. Strontium-90 has been found in fish in the Connecticut River and other waterways in Vermont. The Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, has reached a critical regulatory step towards the startup of the first new nuclear power plant in the U.S. in 20 years. But I wouldn't open those champagne bottles yet, boys. An independent body within the NRC has recommended proceeding with a licensing process for Watts Bar Unit 2 near Spring City, Tennessee. The Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards noted that, quote, there is reasonable assurance, end quote, that a second unit can operate on the Watts Bar plant without undue risk to the health and safety of the public. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You look a little ways upstream from Watts Bar, and what do you find? Boom, dam. Yes, the dam, dam, that's leaking. That's got sinkholes. That's got so many problems, they've lowered the water level on it, and still, nobody knows what's wrong, and that means they don't know how to fix it. Dams upstream of nuclear power stations have already been identified as potential terrorist targets because if the dam goes and the water comes out, That could potentially wipe out, wash out the cooling systems for any reactors downstream, 
And by the way, there are seven reactors downstream of this dam. And in one fell swoop, we've got multiple Fukushimas happening in our own country. On Monday, February 16, 15 organizations announced that they have come together to form Not on Our Fault Line, an alliance that will oppose Dominion Virginia Power's plans for a new nuclear reactor adjacent to the site of the North Anna Reactors 1 and 2. According to Erica Gray, Nuclear Issues Chair for the Virginia Sierra Club, a new nuclear reactor at North Anna is too risky. This reactor would be built on an existing fault line just 11 miles from the epicenter of a 2011 earthquake that exceeded the design standards of the two existing reactors and cracked the Washington Monument some 80 miles away. She went on to say, it is a new reactor design that has never been built and operated commercially. During that earthquake, 25 of 27 dry casks weighing in excess of 100 tons each in which Dominion stores high-level nuclear waste moved as much as four and a half inches as a result of the power of the quake. The Sierra Club's Gray also pointed out more than 21,000 people live within 10 miles of North Anna and 1.6 million live within 50 miles, including the cities of Richmond, Charlottesville, and Fredericksburg. We can't even imagine the cost in human suffering and economic loss if we had to evacuate all these people for months or permanently. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Well, isn't this special? Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant is on the coast of California near San Luis Obispo. It's operated by Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which took the initiative to make changes to the emergency plan that reduced the plan's effectiveness. This according to Nuclear Regulatory Commission Region 4 Administrator Mark Dapas. This spokesmodel for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said the requirement, regardless of whether that zone includes areas of water, sidebar, the Pacific Ocean is right there, the requirement is to provide protective action recommendations for the 10-mile emergency planning zone, regardless of whether that zone includes areas of water. PG&E should have recognized that the changes were not in compliance with those standards and required prior NRC approval. Sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that's what anti-nuclear activists have been saying all along. However, the NRC went on to determine that emergency plan evacuations for the area over the ocean at Diablo Canyon is of low to moderate safety significance. I'm sure that anyone trapped in a nuclear accident that resulted from those ill-designed, already failing nuclear reactors, which happen to be on top of major earthquake faults, would not consider their inability to evacuate as something that was of low to moderate safety significance. But the NRC, always willing to make their nuclear overlords happy, has issued what is called a white finding. How white of them? They say that San Luis Obispo County and the state of California have plans in place, or are supposed to, or some nonsense like that. So that takes PG&E off the hook for any responsibility. The finding actually said, despite the gap in PG&E's emergency plan implementing procedures, at no time was the public going to be allowed to stay in an area that had the potential for radioactivity if an event had occurred. Then how are they supposed to get out? Do you not understand the concept of traffic? Of gridlock? Of the fact that only Highway 101 is a way out from San Luis Obispo? And gee, that thing can get jammed up real easily real fast when there's not even an emergency situation. But hey, nobody in the NRC cares one whit for safety for people as long as they're not the people living in the community. And that's why this week, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and its Siamese twin joined at the hip, Pacific Gas and Electric, are this week's Nuclear. 
nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. We'll have this week's featured interview coming up in just a moment. But first, here's the wind-up and the pitch. Nuclear Hot Seat needs your support in order to keep going. Every month, there are fees for web and audio production services and the ever-increasing bandwidth charges because the more of you listen, the more it costs to host the show. Plus, you know you like to be up close and personal with the news as it is happening, and that's what I endeavored to do, be it last month's strategy conference in San Luis Obispo or Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, the musical, which is coming up in just a week and a half in New York City, and yes, I am going to be there. My goal is to put you in the front row center of everything that's happening in the nuclear movement so that you can have the best information from our top experts delivered to you via podcast once a week. And if you miss a show, there are archives on the website and also on iTunes. Help me help you understand all the aspects of these issues so that you can find the perfect place to make a difference and help continue to derail and turn around this runaway, insane, planet-destroying technology. So if you can, when you can, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red Donate button. No amount is too small. It's all energy, and it is all welcomed from the bottom of my heart. Because by what you do, You help me continue to do what it is that I do. And I thank you for supporting me in getting the work done. This week's interview turned unexpectedly into one of the biggest stunners I have ever done. Mary Olson is director of the Southeast Office for Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS. Olson joined the NEARS staff in 1991 and has run the Southeast Office, based in Ashland, North Carolina, since it was founded in 1999. Olson is a frequent guest on radio and has appeared on national and regional television, as well as being a presenter at international conferences. Mary is an expert on the impact of radiation and how it wrecks disproportionately greater havoc on females than males something I wasn't really aware of before I caught a mention in her recent email and invited her to be our guest this week. Be aware that at one point in the interview, I threw Mary an unexpected question about something that has concerned me for a while regarding genetic vulnerability. Her answer was so stunning, so shocking, and my response shows how truly flabbergasted I was that I've included all of our ad hoc conversation for you to hear with no editing. Full disclosure, I often will have a little side talk with the guests that I'm interviewing, and we plan what the next question is going to be or how to get to the next pod of information. This happens mid-interview, and it always ends up on the cutting room floor, metaphorically speaking. But in this case, I wanted you to hear what I learned, as I learned it, because that's how you'll be learning it, too. Mary Olson, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. It's great to be here. Mary, you looked at gender as a risk factor for cancer from radiation exposure. Why did you choose to do that? Well, Libby, I have had my job with Nuclear Information and Resource Service since 1991, And in about 2008 or 2009, when I was out giving public talks, I had women asking me in the question and answer period about radiation being more harmful to women. And I was astounded. I'd never heard this. Quite frankly, I asked them, did they mean pregnant women? And they said, no, women. And I kind of stopped in my tracks. And it was the Fukushima disaster in 2011 that forced me to realize I had to track this down. So I did. And I called then icon of the 20th century and my mentor, Dr. Rosalie Bertel. And she was the one 
who really encouraged me to follow this up and told me I had to get out a pencil and an eraser and go into the data myself. Where did you look for the information? Well, in 2006, the National Academy of Sciences published the seventh report in a series called The Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. And there's always a bad joke because the acronym is pronounced BEER, but it's B-E-I-R, Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. This has been a serious effort at the national level to look at what we know and don't know about radiation. It's been very difficult to feel that it was fair and balanced, but number seven is very interesting report, and it actually printed numbers from the lifespan study, LSS, which is really the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the people who did not get vaporized the days that the bombs fell on those cities, but actually survived, but were exposed to a single blast of gamma rays. And so those people were tracked throughout their lives. Indiana, you mentioned that there are problems with the Beer 7 data. What did you mean? The study didn't start until five years after the bombs were dropped. So many of the people who were most impacted by radiation were already dead when the study started. Therefore, we have a skewed population to begin with. The next problem is that the researchers assumed well, this is a moral problem more than a research problem, but they assumed that if they gave any medical assistance at all to the people they were studying, that it would skew their results. And so in many respects, we have the results of poverty and loss of infrastructure as impacting health as much as radiation in this body of data. And the third problem is that they totally assumed the only radiation that impacted these people was the event on August 6th and on August 9th, 1945, when atomic bombs were dropped on these populations. They did, however, structure the study in a way that allows us to make some broad generalizations. And that structure was to group people by approximately how much radiation on a reconstructed dose they think they got and how old they were at the time of the bombing. They counted cancers and cancer deaths and that's what was published by the National Academy of Sciences with some other studies thrown in as well, but that's the main body of data and the biggest place that it has been shared where the public can access it relatively easily. And that's what I sat down and did some simple division. They have all these big numbers in big tables and I reduced them down to the simple ratio of one in so many. One in so many is where you start seeing these ratios pop out and it turns out that little girls are twice as likely to get cancer at some point in their lives if they're exposed between the age of birth and five years old than little boys in the same age group and the same exposure level. Half the rate of cancer at some point in their lives for boys compared to girls. What have you discovered might be the reason behind this differential between boys and girls? Well, the interesting thing is that the National Academy of Science, it, with their large panel of many scientists and lots of peer review, don't even mention gender as a risk factor. And I still don't know, and honestly, I should someday ask whether they saw it and just decided not to say anything, or if they just plain missed it. And the same findings were published by Dr. Arjun Makajani in 2006 under his campaign, Healthy from the Start. He's with the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, but I had no awareness of his paper. Now, both of us are just talking about patterns in numbers of large numbers of people exposed to a very special situation, which was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Where does it go from there? We have not seen another real study on this question, let alone an explanation, which is what you're asking me. So, no, there is no place I can point to that says this is why. But one possibility would be a different ratio of fat tissue. And Dr. Rosalie, my mentor, mentioned disproportionate amount of reproductive tissue, which we know to be more reactive to radiation exposure. The female body, even when it's a juvenile, has more radiosensitive reproductive cells than do boys. Now, boys get sick. We can't act like it's okay for boys to be exposed. Boys get cancer, boys die from it at some point in their lives after being exposed. 
but at less of a rate than do girls. Girls are twice as likely. Do we know why this is the case? No, we don't know why. And we have a rising generation of professionals who I hope will tackle it because this is really important. Now, Dr. Rosalie Bertel had a suggestion. She says that reproductive tissue is hot tissue in terms of being vulnerable to damage from ionizing radiation exposure and that female bodies have probably roughly 50% more reproductive tissue if you can include the mammary areas and the uterus. That's one hypothesis. But we do know very clearly that there's a lot of metabolic and biochemical differences based on gender, and it's quite possible that there's something in addition. I want to unfold one more piece, and that is that the lifespan study of Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors show that when the radiation exposure happened as adults, in other words, in 1945, the individual in question, both male and female, were adults, over the rest of their lifespans, women got 50% more cancer. So for every two men who got cancer in the lifespan study, if they were exposed as adults, three women got cancer. So I still think that's very significant. It's not quite as high a difference as in the childhood case, but it's there. And something that every woman has a right to know. One of the things that I have wondered about when a little girl is born, she already has inside of herself all of the eggs she will ever have for her entire life. So in essence, we are all the genetic offspring of our father and our maternal grandmother because that's whose body formed the eggs. Is it possible that the presence of these eggs from birth in little girls might have some impact or something to do with the fact that females are more at risk from exposure to radiation. Maybe you've put your hammer on the head of a nail that's extremely important in our discussion of the environmental impacts of radiation. However, I do not believe the fact that our eggs as females are formed in our grandmother's body is a risk factor. It's the opposite. The fact that our grandmother's bodies contribute the mitochondria and all the non-DNA portions of the egg, right? I mean, once you're an embryo, you're a combination of the DNA in that egg plus the father's sperm, as you pointed out. It's a combination of the grandmother and the father genetically. But it's also a protective feature of the impacts of environment on the human species. There was a lot of confidence in the male policy, and I'm, I'm using that term because in the 1950s and 60s, our policy structure was almost exclusively male, and today it is still two-thirds or more male. So in a gender conversation, we need to point that out. Those policy guys felt very confident about nuclear technology because there was not a big bump up in cancer as soon as they started testing nuclear weapons and they knew there was fallout going nationwide. The thing they didn't factor is that you don't get atomic eggs for two generations. And by atomic eggs, I mean the egg cell was made in a body that was being directly affected by radioactivity in the environment. And so that is why, in my view, the big cancer epidemic lagged behind the dawn of the atomic age because it took two generations to get atomic eggs. That was my theory. I wanted to set you up to be able to talk about it, but I've been wondering about this, and I'm no geneticist. It just struck me. This part is not going to be in the interview. Well, the part about the atomic eggs can be because Dr. Arjun Makajani started going around saying he was 90 years old because he understood damn well what I was saying when I brought this up in a, a discussion with him. Um, Oh, no, 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 the information, I mean, the information yeah. about the eggs, so, I think I mean, that is crucial to our but understanding. Arjun, Arjun loves to say he's 90 years old and then explain why, because he, he understood the significance of the fact that the men and women of 1945 and 1960 were the product of eggs that were formed at least 20 years earlier. Meaning so, before the start of the atomic age. Exactly. So you, you don't get 
atomic eggs until you have the great grandchildren. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I'm just stunned to finally hear confirmation of this. This is uh, it, it's it's bad news, but great information. The field that is going to tackle the questions of how ionizing radiation impacts our bodies and potentially why there's a gender link to the risk for cancer is the field of epigenetics. Yes, genetics is involved. Yes, genetics is intimately involved in the induction of cancer. But the epigenetics, meaning how those genetic instructions are translated out into the cell, all the operations of the cell that access the DNA in the first place, all of that's called epigenetics. And that is the field, I believe, that will start unraveling some of these mysteries. But there's a whole lot that has been excluded from radiation protection in the sense of the field of health physics, in the sense of federal development of radiation, quote unquote, protection standards. You have to understand that all of it is rooted in the production of these same bombs. And when there were just a few places in the whole world that had concentrated radioactivity, and you were sending military and paramilitary males into those places, those places being Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were enriching the uranium, the very few uranium mines that had been developed. The only test site was in New Mexico at Trinity, et cetera, et cetera. These were very limited places that were highly radioactive. You had standards based on exposing young male bodies, and that was the standard reference man. We now know that you cannot meet a one in a million standard for a little girl, which socially we say industrial activities, well, if it causes one cancer in a million, okay. And it was super fun. They had to back off of that. It was too hard. They would cause one cancer in 100,000. In a few cases, maybe one cancer in 10,000 exposed. These are the risk factors that our federal government considers allowable. Well, our current radiation standards for adult males allow a risk factor of one in 286 people exposed. Way below. That's the 100 milliram a year, okay? That's like not even the Fukushima devastating criminal increase to two rems or 2,000 millirems a year that they're allowing at Fukushima. That's the 100 millirems a year is a risk factor for one in 286. That's not Dr. Rosalie's numbers. That's not Dr. John Goffman's numbers. That is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's own numbers. So if you take those numbers and multiply by the risk factors that you'd have to adopt in order to protect little girls, you can't do it. You have to be closing facilities down and cleaning up. The coefficient has to be negative in order to protect little girls. So basically, we now have the ability to stand up and say that the nuclear complex is incompatible with the future of our species. Because I'm on a tirade, but the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was going to revise the radiation standards, and I brought up little girls, and they said something about a subpopulation. I said, dear, little girls are not a subpopulation. Little girls in Chicago are a subpopulation, but little girls are integral to the life cycle of our species. And they stopped. They said, oh, you're right. But this is a male leader in our EPA at a federal level going to rewrite a radiation standard as if a little girl is a subpopulation. It pisses me off. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not usually stunned when it comes to figuring out the next question I'm going to ask, but, man, you did it to me with that one. It is such a lethal blind spot for our species. Yes. We've known that the nuclear future is no future. We've known this. And so I wrapped up my talk to the 158 country delegations in Vienna, Austria, on their consideration of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons in December, where I was. I said, look, we talk about nuclear war, we say there is no cure, only prevention. And I turned around and said, prevention is the cure. You know, the whole precautionary principle thing didn't catch on really far, and part of that is because we are innovators, we are experimenters, and if you take precaution, you can't do anything. But this isn't about innovation or, or experimentation. We know the data is in. 
National Academy of Sciences published it. All I did was take a pencil and an eraser and do the math to find out, well, what's the gender factor? And the gender factor is very bad news. And so now it's time to say the experiment is over and prevention is the cure, and now we have to stop and clean up and contain and you know, we still have a possibility of making it. But if we don't stop, look, and listen now, we're well over the cliff. How was this information received when you offered it in Vienna and in other conferences and experiences where you had the chance to get it in front of people who maybe could do something about it? You know, Libby, I'm just starting. I published the paper in 2011, and then I stepped back in part because they started wanting to build new nuclear power plants, and it seemed more valuable use of my time to just go ahead and try and stop those. And happily, we have pretty much scrubbed the next generation through the efforts of many different organizations, including Nuclear Information Resource Service. The next generation of nuclear reactors is pretty much on hold and putting itself in the ditch as we speak, it's a retirement party, not a renaissance. So that was good. But now it's bugging me. People have a right to know. Parents have a right to know that their little girls are twice at risk as our little boys. And one of the things that's difficult, of course, is that right now the known exposures are mostly medical. And I don't want to attack any type of medicine for anybody, but I still think people have a right to know, and especially since those occupational workplaces are dominated by female employees. Have they been told? I don't think so. And so I'm sort of getting back in the track, and certainly this invitation to speak in Vienna was a great opportunity to frame it. But Again, the other difficulty is the, the data is thin. We have the largest data set in the world on ionizing radiation exposure with a long lifespan study, but we have no idea, no idea about places like Chernobyl or Fukushima or Marshall Islands or any of the places where people have been living in the soup of the radioactivity. Is it the same? We don't know. But this is closer to an X-ray. An external exposure of gamma rays is closer to an X-ray. So the medical context, the aviation context, people who fly a lot, do women think about this? They don't even know about it. Where are you taking this information next? Are you going on the road? Are you doing a series of speaking engagements? Are you open to being booked for speaking engagements? I go where I'm invited. Um, we don't have a lot of funding right now for going on the road. There is a bit of a stirring in the southeastern United States where I live and work to try and reach out uh, a little more broadly to get this information out. I would love to talk to people in organized labor, people in health and health education. There's more questions than there are answers, but we should be asking those questions and we should be pushing each other to get the answers. I can't imagine that mommy and me groups or grandmother groups would not be shocked, horrified, and motivated to put some energy into getting this information out into the world because women are the ones who are connected with childbirth and that life cycle most intimately. Yes. And they would be, I think, some really good targets for this. So my appeal is out to the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. If you are in a group, if you know a group, healthcare, unions, moms, grandmoms, anything at all that might be able to benefit from hearing Mary talk about this to raise the awareness, would you please get in touch and what's the best way to contact you about this? My email is Mary O at nirs.org, that's Nuclear Information and Resource Service dot organization. We have a website, www.nirs.org. There's a contact us frame on that website. You can reach me that way. And if there's any response at all, I'll be inspired to put up a little crowdsource fundraising page to help with raising funds for travel because I basically have no program budget at all. I do have my time, and I am available, and I want people to have this information to be able to make their own choices because government protecting us is a long way off. And if people wish to read any of your writing on this subject or take a look at a video 
of you speaking about it. Where could they gain access to that? Go to nears.org. Then on the left side, there's a link that says radiation. Press that. And when you get to that page, at the top, there's another link on the left side that says health effects. And the health effects page is all about the gender link in terms of risk factor for cancer from radiation exposure. And again, this is one study that talks about a single external exposure of gamma radiation, which is a lot like x-rays, across a whole population of people of different ages and then tracking them over their lifetime. We don't actually know a whole lot more about real life, like what if you live where there's contamination in the water. We don't know about that, and we're not going to know about it because nobody's funding the kind of epidemiological work it would take to find out. And why is that? Because the nuclear industry is major donors to the people who make those decisions. And as we are all learning in the age of money is speech, <laughs> we have to speak up. So here's looking to get some dollars together for you to, at minimum, fund a speaking tour and a major PR push because I cannot imagine that if people knew this information, especially women knew this information, they would not be in the streets demonstrating, contacting legislators, and demanding that this nuclear juggernaut be derailed, turned around, and flattened as best possible. So we have a possibility of a future for the human species. Thank you, Libby, so much for giving me this opportunity to connect to your already active group of people. And I hear your partnership in this moment, and I look forward to it more in the future. And I welcome anybody listening, reaching out and bringing about the wonderful image you have. Again, a gender-based comment. I love men. I love their view of the world. I know that because they are in the policy seat, money matters. But quite frankly, women don't really care that much about money. We care about our babies. And this is all about the babies. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you are doing for this terrifying hit of information and for sharing it as graciously and as thoroughly as you just have with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. That was Mary Olson of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NIRS. She can be reached at nirs.org. We'll post the video of her presentation at the Vienna Conference, as well as a direct link to the page she spoke about that deals with the impact of radiation. It will all be up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 191. John Stewart. Well, what can I say? You may have thrown in the towel on The Daily Show, but I haven't. It may be too late for me to become your, John Stewart's, nuclear pundit, but someone is going to have to take your place, and they are going to need me. And who knows? They might be easier for me to access. So, John, Booby, I'd still love to get it on with you while you're still in office, as it were. But know that while I'll always love you, I am completely capable of moving my affections and intentions to another host, the next host. And if it's a woman, so much the better. Activist shout-outs. Good to know that Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education, our favorite Vermont Yankee, will be speaking in London at a public meeting in the House of Commons on Tuesday, March 10, a mere one day before the anniversary the fourth anniversary of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Nick Thabit and Cecile Pineda, the author of Devil's Tango, How I Learned the Fukushima Step by Step, have put out a call for us to deliver letters to Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe by taking the letter to the Consulate of Japan in a city near you. Full information and suggested wording are available on the site Fukushima Fourth Anniversary Events dot blogspot dot com, and that's all spelled out. Finally, this sad note: Dr. Ernest Sternglass died on Thursday, 
February 12th in Ithaca, New York, at the age of 91. After escaping from Nazi Germany in late 1938 to enter the United States, he first became a physicist and a noted inventor whose TV cameras sent the first live pictures back from the moon's surface and were also used in the Hubble Space Telescope. In our community, Dr. Sternglass was known as a brilliant and leading anti-nuclear activist. His testimony at the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty hearings in 1963 contributed to halting atmospheric bomb testing in that same year, and he considered this his greatest achievement. As it drastically lowered the environmental radioactivity across the globe, and probably saved many lives. In the late 1960s, Sternglass was the first to attempt to calculate the victims of the bomb tests, estimating that 375,000 American infants died in excess of the expected numbers. He was blasted for daring to make such a revelation. But to this day, Nobody has explained any factor accounting for the near halt of steady declines in infant death rates during the 20th century. He co-founded Radiation and Public Health Project with Dr. Jay Gould in 1989 and remained active within that group until he was nearly 90 years of age. More on Dr. Ernest Sternglass can be found on the page radiation.org which is the home of Radiation and Public Health Project. It's always a sadness to lose one of our elders. Here's today's final thought. As you could probably tell from my reaction to Mary Olson's information, her piece about the impact of radiation on girls and women rocked me, and not in a good way. I'd long suspected that one of the reasons we saw a delay in the genetic impact of exposure to nuclear radiation was because, as I stated in the interview, every female is born with all the eggs she will ever have fully formed inside her. Genetically speaking, that means we are all the offspring of our father and our maternal grandmother. That means the atomic exposure of the egg that led to your birth was set by the date your mother was born. Since July 16 of 1945 and the Trinity test blast in Almogordo, New Mexico, the clock has been ticking on the DNA of every female on this planet, to be specific, on her eggs. Atomic eggs. That's what Mary Olson called them, and I think the label is an appropriate one. They are the eggs of human reproduction that bear the impact, carry the legacy of nuclear radiation exposure. It takes two generations for that impact to show up, so this radiological curse will not come down on the children but the grandchildren, and through them, on to the future. This begs the question, might that delayed impact from Trinity, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the thousands of atmospheric bomb blasts, plus the leakage from nuclear reactors, accidents, uranium mining, weapons manufacturing, and all the rest, be what's behind the soaring rates of autism, autoimmune diseases, leukemia, and other cancers, undiagnosable learning disabilities in our children, and more that keeps showing up in our kids now? today. As transgenerational DNA damage continues to concentrate and overlap in ongoing generations, are we finally seeing what is merely the start of the impact of this diabolical technology in the declining health and vitality of our children? It's an old cliche that children are our future, but it's our grandchildren who will show our genetic truth our true legacy. And I believe that this stark, unassailable fact of atomic eggs is the fulcrum by which we can pivot the whole nuclear debate away from economics and cost-benefit ratios and permissible releases and into the terror of a destiny that seems to promise us damaged children and grandchildren and beyond. I believe that if women, especially mothers, 
and those who wish to be mothers and grandmothers knew this part of the nuclear equation, we would have an explosive, powerful, ever-growing, unstoppable movement that would demand sanity and safety out of nuclear, meaning shut it down, neutralize or safely store the waste, and figure out what we're going to do to make certain that it never threatens us again. Not just for now, but for all the generations to come. Native Americans, First Nations people, counsel that we must not make a decision. We must take no action unless its impact has been computed to the seventh generation. Seven generations from now, where will we be? Who will we be as a species? Will we be at all? I believe that there's still time to turn this around. But I do wonder, will we be able to do it? Have we the will? Do we have the numbers? Anyone know of a good mommy and me group that might want to have a speaker? Let's go for it. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 17, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, fairwinds.org, Fukushima 4th Anniversary Events.blogspot.com, The Guardian, NBC News, USGS Quakelist, NHK, cnic.jp slash English, nuclear-news.net, Kyoto News, Al Jazeera, International Atomic Energy Agency, dailymail.co.uk, Greenpeace.org, thestar.com, scott-ludlam.greensmps.org, Virginia Sierra Club, rutlandherald.com, nbc29.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, KOMO4 News, Radiation and Public Health Project, those clueless destruction pushers at World Nuclear News, and the ever-popular, ever-present Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to visit and join. A belated acknowledgment to Myla Reason for background information on the WIP site that was used in formulating last week's questions for nuclear watchdog Don Hancock. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on the website. Just search for a term and you can find it. You can also look on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts. We've also got a YouTube channel that carries the show. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Please do not use Facebook because I tend to lose the thread. I get too many messages. I may misplace it. Send an email. It sticks around forever. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardest Street Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardest Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.